Okay, our uh, next keynote speaker is uh, Dr. Perry Savazade. Quiet, please. Dr. Savazade is an associate professor of clinical dentistry at the Austro School of Dentistry at USC. He has so many titles. <laughs> and uh, also the director of USC Center for Biofilm. And uh, Dr. Savazade also serves as the uh, section chair of Diagnostic Sciences in the Division of Periodontology, Diagnostic Science, and Dental Hygiene. He's also the Director of Oral Pathology and Radiology Hybrid Distance Learning Program. Told you, many, many titles. <laughs> Very good, Parrish. I've known Parrish for many years since he was a student here. As a uh, clinician scientist, Dr. Savazade conducts research and teaches oral maxillofacial pathology, radiology, uh, medicine, with a uh, very active intramural practice. He has published more than uh, 80 uh, peer-reviewed publications. His research lab and clinical research projects at USC focuses on characterization and treatment of microbiofilm, particularly osteomyelitis and osteonecrosis, where he developed novel bone-targeting antimicrobial therapies. So please join me and welcome Parish Sabazade to uh, give us our uh, All right. I can't stay still, so. Where's the pointer? All right, yeah. Not the best, but it'll work. All right. So as a pathologist and clinician scientist, this is one of the main areas that I study and do research and actually see patients in clinical practice, and it is called osteomyelitis, and it has many forms. So basically, osteo is bone, myelo means marrow, and itis is inflammation. Because histologically, pathologically, there's actually inflammation of the marrow around the bone. And this was reported by pathologists, paleopathologists, which is a subspecialty of either pathology or paleontology, um, well over 150 million years ago in, in dinosaurs, right? Allosaurus was the first time it was kind of identified. And then Hippocrates documented it at 400 BC uh, in humans. And knowing that it goes way back before that, probably other scientists and scholars and, and physicians have, have reported it. Um, but Hippocrates gets the credit um, for documenting it around 400 BC. So there's lots of different subtypes, uh, or what we call ICD, International Classification of Disease for Osteomyelitis. There's acute, subacute, and chronic, and then there's also refractory chronic cases that don't respond to treatment. There's primary or secondary, for example, secondary to diabetes or immunosuppression or other diseases like that. Um, there's suppurative versus non-suppurative, meaning whether there's pus or not. There's localized or diffuse. And then there's Garay's osteomyelitis or pro proliferative periostitis. There's septic arthritis, basically an infection in the joint. Um, so a lot of times this field of osteomyelitis is called infectious bone disease or bone and joint infections. And then there's also osteonecrosis, which is basically when the bone dies after osteomyelitis, but it's categorized as a subtype of osteomyelitis. And radiation osteonecrosis falls under that. It's not a sterile, it's actually a septic process. Osteonecrosis of the jaw, and dentists were familiar with medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw, emrange, right? Um, then there's aseptic necrosis or avascular necrosis, and then there's spontaneous and idiopathic cases. And then some classifications uh, use the anatomic site because the, there's different anatomic uh, sites actually tend to be very unique as far as the type of pathogens and the approaches to treatment and the morbidity and mortality. For example, there's DFO, diabetic foot osteomyelitis, which is very common in patients with diabetic ulcers that then gets to the periosteum and the bone and then they get a very bad infection and a lot of times that has to be amputated or resected. Um, so it's a very significant disease. Uh, vertebral cases are also unique. Then there's long bone osteo, and then there's jaw bone osteo, which is a very unique beast in and of itself. And then there's hematogenous, for example, acute hematogenous osteomyelitis is mainly seen in pediatric populations where it's kind of a disseminated um, disease. And then there's what we call PJIs, prosthetic joint infections. This is what we call periprosthetic osteomyelitis or peri-implant osteomyelitis. In dentistry, we could say peri-implantitis, same thing. And then I would even argue that um, periodontitis, when it involves bone infection, alveolar bone loss, 
is basically a type of osteomyelitis. And I know the periodontists in the room are going to roll their eyes. We'll talk about this a little more later. <laughs> but um, but so, so those are the different types. All right. I'll have to walk over here and do this manually. <laughs> Battery is running low. Ah. OK. There we go. All right, so this is what a jawbone osteomyelitis looks like, and it has very characteristic features here. So these blue arrows are pointing to what we call a sequestrum, and this is basically an area of non-vital or dead bone that's just floating in this abscess or infection where there's lysis around it. And it's a very characteristic feature of, of osteomyelitis and, and osteonecrosis, if you will. So this is a coronal view showing it. Here's an axial view. You can see normal bone on this side, abnormal bone with the sequestrum floating there in the middle, and then you can see the bone in the oral cavity there. Um, here's a plain film of ephemeral osteomyelitis, and here's a tibial osteomyelitis, or what we call a Brody's abscess. Um, and then these are an axial and sagittal CT scan. And you can see again here on this axial, you have that abscess, and then in the middle is that sequestrum, that characteristic kind of floating bone. Radiographically, it's very characteristic, but it's not pathognomonic. So you can't just look at a radiograph and say, for sure it's osteomyelitis. But when you see findings like this, it's very highly suggestive. Other features are periosteal reaction. You can see how there's kind of a swelling and sclerosis around it. And uh, that's often called an involucrum um, radiographically. And then here are T1, the tibial case that I showed you. These are T1-weighted uh, MRI images and, uh, with and uh, without and with fat suppression. And you can see that, again, here's that Brody's abscess or osteomyelitis in the tibia. And it's tracking through a fistula and going into Hoffa's fat pad here um, in the knee. And so when these get to the joint, it's called septic arthritis. And if you think about it, the, the bones are actually, the skeleton is very well protected. Right? It's very hard to get an osteomyelitis because there's many layers, periosteum, soft tissues, muscles, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we do see it in certain instances. And the instances that we see it are usually things like disseminated infection that happens to get to the bone um, or trauma, surgery, hip replacement surgery, um, periodontal disease, and then it gets to the bone, for example, in jawbone osteomyelitis. And here's an example of medication-related osteonecrosis or osteomyelitis of the jaw. Um, starts out as just kind of an area with pain and swelling, and then eventually the bone becomes exposed. Again, it has that characteristic sequestrum, that dead bone, and the body in the jaws, the jaws are very interesting. When there's sequestrum in the jaws, the body tries to get it out, actually, right? Which is a little different than what we see in long bone or other sites when you have sequestrum. It's very hard. The body can't push that out. But in the jaw bones, it can actually push it out. And it tries to do that uh, very regularly, actually. Um, and then when that sequestrum is gone and the tissue is debrided, it heals. Here's a 3D reconstruction showing that sequestrum. And it's going to the antrum of the sinus, uh, floor of the sinus there, maxillary sinus. So it can be significant disease. And in rare instances, patients can die from this. It, it, the morbidity can be high, but there can be actually mortality from, uh, from this also. So up, up until relatively recently, as far as, you know, if you think about how long osteomyelitis has been around, when it was first described, it wasn't until very recently that we actually knew what caused it. There were many, many theories going around that it might just be an autoimmune condition, uh, maybe it's viral, maybe it's inflammatory, um, but we're not sure exactly what's going on. But now we know that it has a microbial uh, causation or etiology. And like I said, the different sites are very unique, but for the most part, Staph aureus is the number one pathogen. Most, more than 90% of cases are caused by Staph aureus. And we can even see Staph in jawbone infections. But for jawbone infections, it tends to be periodontal pathogens, um, like Fusobacterium, AA, or Aggregatobacter, and Actinomyces species. So the jawbones tend to be polymicrobial and kind of unique. But um, any of these can be polymicrobial and staph is still kind of the number one cause. The clinical things that we see are pain, swelling, redness, fever, kind of cardinal signs of inflammation, redness, heat, swelling, pain. You can have pus, fistula. You can have pathologic fracture, where the bone breaks. Um, and then laboratory findings are nonspecific, but you can have an increased erythrocyte sedimentation rate or C-reactive protein or increased neutrophils or lymphocytes, depending on if it's acute or chronic. 
um, but again, not pathognomonic. Now, interestingly, in 1984, Christina and Kosterton, he was one of my mentors, uh, whose lab I kind of took over, and he coined the term biofilms. You know, he was the, the father of biofilm microbiology. And in 1984, in an orthopedic journal, um, they, they, they proposed the biofilm theory for osteomyelitis and said, look, we think we know what causes it for the first time. These infections are actually due to bacteria that are attached to surfaces like plaque, for example, um, and it causes periodontal disease. And they said that in 1984. Christina went on to publish that in Science in 1985 by taking human samples from orthopedic surgeries and actually characterizing them and showing that they were indeed biofilms. And so she got a science publication out of that in a year afterwards. Um, and then, it, but it, it took up until two, the 2000s um, for clinicians to even understand that this is really a biofilm-mediated disease and what that means as far as clinical implications, why it's hard to treat, why it's hard to diagnose, why it's not culturable or cultivable all the time as far as the organisms go and things like that. Um, Costerton and I in 2009 reported jawbone osteomyelitis as a biofilm disease, and that was the first time that was reported. Before then, very little literature on jawbone osteomyelitis. No one really knew what caused it, and it was, um, some of the literature thought it was basically an autoimmune condition. They didn't know that, that organisms played a role. And part of this was because the technology was limited, right? There were molecular methods. We already had the Watson and Crick, DNA, all that kind of stuff. There were indirect or molecular methodologies for identifying and speciating bacteria, but there weren't direct ways of visualizing it. And unless you show people, especially clinicians, they don't get it. They don't understand it sometimes. And, and I, I speak as a clinician myself. Um, so, uh, it really took time for the technology to catch up, and I'll, uh, and I'll touch on that a little more in a second. So when we do metagenomic in investigation, for example, um, these indirect methodologies versus direct visualization with like microscopes and things like that. Um, for example, in jawbone osteo osteomyelitis, we see very characteristic pathogens. Um, the majority are proteobacteria or firmicutes. Um, and, and we actually see lots of viruses, about an order of magnitude more viruses uh, as pathogens than bacteria. So we think it's actually a very complex, multi-species. We also see candida and yeast. So it's not just bacteria anymore. It's, it's really a polymicrobial unique um, situation that we have uh, with these infections. And it's probably true at, at most body sites, not just the jaw bones. So what's the significance? Osteomyelitis is a limb and life-threatening infection. It's difficult to treat, and it's a major financial burden. Uh, bacterial biofilms, methicillin, uh, susceptible, staph aureus. There are some MRSA cases, multidrug resistant, methicillin resistant, but for the most part, it's just your routine staph um, cause most of the cases. Uh, we know that biofilms are notoriously difficult to treat. Um, as dentists, we know that. That's what we're constantly battling with, with periodontal disease and caries and things like that. Um, an analysis of the morbidity and mortality with biofilm infections indicate that over 12 million people in the U.S. are affected and about 400,000 die because of these types of infections. They're, it's a very unique type of infection. Before the advent of antibiotic therapy, osteomyelitis was high mortality. If you got it, you would almost certainly die from it. Um, jawbone cases were actually the most common. Tooth infections, periodontal disease, extending jawbone osteomyelitis, and then in the maxilla, you can imagine that's at the base of the brain, not far from it. So very significant complications like brain involvement or ophthalmologic involvement or sepsis and dissemination, and patients would die routinely, most commonly from jawbone osteomyelitis. Um, with antibiotic therapy, the jawbone cases were actually relatively well controlled, but other sites remained problematic and, have, and became a lot more common and difficult to manage. Um, and then since the use of anti-resorptive therapy, drugs for osteoporosis or myeloma, like bisphosphonates or denosumab, we're seeing a rise again in jawbone osteomyelitis and necrosis uh, cases. So osteomyelitis pharm pharmacotherapy really represents an unmet medical need. We, we really don't have good treatment for this, and I'll, I'll talk about why we don't. So this is what a biopsy of osteomyelitis looks like. Here's normal bone on the bottom left, on your bottom left here. Um, and normal bone has these nice reversal lines, uh, lamellar bone as we call it, and then there's these little lacunae that have these dark little uh, cells in them. Um, these are called osteocytes. And then there's this fatty marrow, these clear stuff with the blood vessel and the little red blood cells in it there. And that's normal bone. When you look at osteomyelitis, it's a hot mess. 
right? You have this bone there that you can see. Again, there's the lamellar bone, but there's no osteocytes in the lacunae. It's what we call osteocyte dropout. So right away that shows us, independent of anything else on that slide, it tells me that bone is not vital because there's no vital cells in it. And then when you look around in the marrow, the marrow is severely inflamed. There's all these little dark cells. There's fibrin and necrosis, and there's bleeding. So again, myelitis, right? Marrow inflammation. And the inflammation doesn't go into the bone. It's all around the bone. So this is why it's called osteomyelitis. It's a pathologic diagnosis. So as I mentioned earlier, Christina and Costerton and some of the early investigators um, were limited because when you just look at light microscopy, a compound light microscope that a pathologist would look at has about a 10x eyepiece and then anywhere from a 10x to about 50x um, uh, magnification. So it's kind of like 10 times 10 or 10 times 50. About the most you can get is 1,000 times normal magnification with a compound microscope. And so this is the, about the best image that you can get. So here's another example of an osteomyelitis. Again, there's a bone, no osteocytes in the lacunae. There's some bleeding and inflammatory cells. So this is osteomyelitis. But there's this purple stuff attached to the surface. And usually this comes out in histologic processing. You can't see it. But what this is is actually bacteria, biofilm bacteria attached to the surface. And this went undetected for hundreds and hundreds of years. No one really knew what this was. So osteomyelitis was always the bone, dead, and then the inflammation, and so hence osteomyelitis, right? And that's why no one really thought that this could be an infectious process, because you couldn't see the bugs. But when you do things like electron microscopy, and the first electron microscope DuPont came out with in 1965, it was called the stereo scan. But it, didn't, it took another 10 to 20 years before researchers were actually using it. And so when you look at the bone in an osteomyelitis specimen with electron microscopy, where you can go past 1,000 times magnification up to 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 10, magnification, you start to get a much different impression of what's actually happening. You start to see that purple stuff attached to the bone, even when you can't see it on a histologic H&E biopsy. And you see beautiful, nice morphotypes of bacterium. Like I said, in jawbone cases, we see fusobacterium. We also see cocci, like streptococci. Actinomyces um, are common. And here's an example of bone. Uh, looking at this with confocal microscopy in fish fluorescence in situ hybridization. And this is a probe, a red probe, that's actually based on ribosomal content and viability of cells. And the more red that it appears, uh, the higher the metabolism. And you can see the, the bacteria, when they're attached to the bone, they're very bright red versus the ones that are just floating around and not attached to the bone. So we know that there's something happening when these organisms are attached to the bone as biofilm pathogens. There, there's a very unique lifestyle that's, that's going on there. Um, so has anyone heard of this bone diagenesis research? You know, usually when I bring this up, People are like, yeah, I've never heard of that. It's a very fascinating area of research. Um, it's big, so it's an area of research in, under paleopathology or paleontology. And what they do is they study post-mortem bone decomposition. And when animals die, or humans, um, there are certain changes that happen to the bone. And this is one of the things that these specialists study. So, Ba and it's, to me, it was very relevant, the type of research that was being done in bone diagenesis research as a pathologist based on what I saw clinically with patients with osteomyelitis. For example, in jawbone osteomyelitis or osteonecrosis, we routinely see that sequestrum that I was talking about earlier, right? That dead bone just floating there. Well, that bone doesn't have blood supply, really. So you can't get therapy to it. So that's why it becomes very difficult to treat. You can give all the antibiotics you want, and we do. We give months to years of antibiotics, sometimes IV antibiotics, and sometimes we can't give any more antibiotics because it's toxic to the patient, and then the patient will die from the disease. Um, and so what we noticed clinically, well, what I noticed clinically very early on was that we still see this continued sequestrum formation, and sequestrum kind of gets resorbed over time, and it didn't make sense how this was happening if it's purely an itis or an inflammatory process. And it's thought to be purely really an inflammatory process. Even if the bacteria are there, now we know bacteria uh, cause it, 
It's the inflammatory response that causes all the bone damage and destruction, just like periodontitis, for example. It's an inflammatory destruction, osteoclasts, phagocytes, et cetera, et cetera. But that didn't make sense because I couldn't figure out, well, when I look at these biopsies, when I look at the radiographs, when I see the patients clinically, when I do surgery on these patients, there isn't blood supply to these sequestra. Where is the immune, how are the immune cells getting to the sequestrum? How are they getting into the bone? Are they, how are they eating the bone when the bone keeps getting dissolved and destroyed? So, um, so I thought, you know what? Why can't the bacteria themselves just eat the bone or destroy the bone? Just like they do with enamel, right? And there's no enamel-itis or inflammation, right? There's no blood supply to enamel. Right? Bacteria just dissolve enamel. They do it through acidification and things like that. So why not bone? Why would it be so different or unique that, that this bone would have nothing to do with the way enamel gets destroyed, right? Um, and, and, uh, and bacteria are causative in both conditions, right? So based on these clinical radiographic and surgical findings in osteomyelitis and sequestrum, um, we, hy I, you know, we hypothesize that biofilms can destroy this bone without immune response or osteoclastogenesis. Um, and we know from this field that various factors of the burial environment post-mortem contribute to degradation of the skeleton. And those include pH, temperature, the soil composition, whether there's oxygen or not, the chemistry of the groundwater in which the person's buried, and then most importantly, microbial-induced bioerosion. Um, and in environmental microbiology and marine microbiology, they des described similar things very well in, dam in damaging colonized biotic and abiotic surfaces um, in processes like biofouling and biocorrosion. So I, uh, you know, I thought naturally there's some maybe similar phenomena going on um, in this instance. So this is an example of some hydroxyapatite. This is an in vitro study that we did where we took hydroxyapatite, uh, cultured some bacteria, Staph aureus, on it, um, and did some computerized planimetry assessment and, and confocal and, thing, and SEM. And what we saw was that as we grew these bugs more than just 24 hours, like most cultures, 48 hours, 72 hours a week, um, we saw some significant destruction of the hydroxyapatite surface. We'd actually see cavitation. We could measure and quantify the cavitation. And there's no immune cells or osteoclasts in these assays. It's just the bacteria, just Staph aureus eating the bone. And we measured the pH of, of these cultures over time. And basically, all uh, Staph aureus just <laughs> would acidify the environment. So it would go from kind of a 7 to 8 pH down to a 5, you know, to 4 or 4 to 5 pH. So acidification may be one of the mechanisms for this destruction, very similar to tooth cavitation or enamel cavitation originally. Um, so what we think is happening is when these planktonic pathogens attach and form a biofilm, um, they can actually form these sequestra independent of host immunity. And we've shown that with, this is candida, and you can see the cavitations that are happening on hydroxyapatite. This was staph, uh, pseudomonas, and this was staph. The bugs have been removed, and you can see trails and, uh, and these, this is, these are all perfectly smooth surfaces, like this area here. Um, and then you can see nice deep cavitations with Staph aureus, for example. So normally we always think osteoclasts can only do this trailing phenomena. Uh, osteoclasts and immune cells can only cause cavitations. Well, osteoclasts do it with an acid acidification also. They're like sludge machines. They just acidify underneath them, uh, and, and that's how they dissolve and destroy bone. Um, so. Um, so how do we treat this condition? Surgery and antimicrobial therapy, often prolonged antimicrobial therapy, are the mainstays of treatment for osteomyelitis. It's very, very difficult to treat. And uh, a lot more recently, um, we're using hyperbaric oxygen. Um, a lot of these bugs, as I've mentioned earlier, most of them are facultative anaerobes or anaerobes. Staph aureus, periodontal pathogens, vertebral osteo, diabetic foot osteo, they don't like oxygen-rich environments. So hyperbaric oxygen seems to have some utility, and there's evidence that supports that. Um, we routinely use it for osteoradionecrosis, but now we're using it for chronic superlative osteomyelitis, chronic refractory osteomyelitis, um, jawbone osteomyelitis and osteonecrosis, et cetera. So, there are antibiotics that are used, for example, fluoroquinolones and oxazolidinones um, for osteomyelitis treatment because they're very good against Staph aureus and these anaerobes and, and these, these pathogens that we see most cases associated with. But the problem is even the best antibiotics that are the most potent in vitro against these pathogens don't go to the skeleton in vivo. 
So when you take antibiotics normally, most antibiotics go, there may be liver, metabolism, get to the tissues, and then come out of the kidney, urine. They don't go to bone. Bone is not a, a compartment for pharmacokinetic distribution of most antibiotics. So there's a challenge right there of how do we get antibiotics to bone? And that's why we don't have good treatments for this. So any improvement in bone bioavailability of antibiotics would be a significant advancement in treating this disease. So there are recent efforts, Dr. Summon actually mentioned some of these, um, local antibiotic delivery systems or targeted chemical approaches. Local delivery systems, actually before orthopedic surgeons were doing this, um, periodontal surgeons were doing local delivery systems and knew that biofilms were causing these infections back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and who knows, you know, maybe even before that. Before, you know, in the 80s and 90s and 2000s when orthopedic surgeons finally discovered, oh, what, this is what a biofilm is. Our field was on the top of that. We had early periodontal PhD investigators that knew what biofilms were. And that's what caused alveolar bone, you know, um, infection and destruction and, and inflammatory response and all that kind of stuff. So one of the problems with the antibiotic delivery systems is that the release kinetics can vary. Sometimes they can be poor, they may not be very sustained, or they may not be uh, degradable. Some of these are non-biodegradable. Uh, the non-biodegradable ones work best, actually, but the problem is you have to go and do a second surgery to remove the device, and that has its own comorbidity, second uh, surgery. So um, one of the areas that I've been working in and, and, and is this kind of targeted chemical or physiologic approach. And we use a, a, some chemistry called conjugation chemistry to exploit the binding infinity of anti-resorptive drugs like bisphosphonates. And so when, when I when we first started doing this, a lot of people said, well, why would you use bisphosphonates? Bisphosphonates can actually cause more necrosis and bone infection, like jawbone, you know, osteomyelitis or osteonecrosis. Well, we actually, um, bisphosphonate chemistry has come a long way since the earlier designs of these drugs that were used clinically. Chemists can make pharmacologically inactive versions of these drugs that don't have any effects on cells or anything. All they do is just bind to the bone. So they're just purely a chemical target to bone without any adverse effects or cellular effects intentionally designed that way uh, chemically. Um, so m most people when you say anti-resorptives, uh, they're, they sh they're familiar with osteoporosis as a disease, right? Osteoporosis, they're drugs like Fosamax or Boniva and in cancer patients with multiple myeloma where they have lytic lesions in bone or metastatic breast or prostate cancer, we use drugs like Zometa, Aredi, or Actinel. These are big drugs, blockbuster drugs, Merck, Novartis, um, you know. And so it, the reason these drugs are used clinically is because they actually save lives. Now, they're not FDA approved for that, and these drugs could never say that. But if you just take a patient with osteoporosis, let's say after a fall and a hip fracture, if you're over the age of 65 and you have your first hip fracture from what is called a silent disease or silent killer, because there's no sign and symptoms. No one walks around going, you know, I think today my bone's a little less dense than it was five years ago. You know, there's no real clinical signs and symptoms until you have an event like a fracture. So 25% die within first year of fracture in the entire population. That is significant. One out of four people that get a hip fracture will die within that first year. And the five-year mortality is not so great either. So, and there's lots of reasons uh, for that. So this is why these drugs are used. They have anti-resorptive properties. They help build the bone, right? They inhibit some osteoclastic activity, and you get greater bone density, and it reduces the fracture rates and saves lives. Just to give you an example, in a two-year study, just taking this drugs for, these drugs for two years, in a large population study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, IV zometa or zoledronic acid reduced the risk of death from any cause by 28% when administered after a hip fracture. Right? 28%. That's very significant. So these are really why these drugs, and it's actually not zometa, it's zoledronic acid. It's an osteoporotic formulation. So these drugs are magic bullets. They're very unique because their chemistry binds them to the bone and very, there's really no other drug that we have that's otherwise relatively safe that does that, except this class of drugs. Um, and so how does it do that? Some basic pharmacokinetics for the dental students. It's, all right. Um, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. When you get a dose 
whether it's oral or intravenous, of these bisphosphonate drugs, it goes into the bloodstream at some point. It equilibrates to the tissues and the bone, but most of it goes to the bone, and it's non-reversible when it binds to the bone. And then the rest comes out in your urine. There's no hepatic metabolism with these drugs. And other than a few adverse effects like jawbone necrosis, which physicians don't give a crap about, to be honest. It's a dental problem, and they're saving lives. So we deal with that, and they'll save people's lives because they're not going to die from the jawbone necrosis. Right? So these are actually what we call magic bullets, and, and they're, they're, it's a profound accomplishment in medicine, modern medicine, therapeutics, and pharmacology. These are wonder drugs. They have saved many, 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 many lives. And so these drugs are very, very simple compounds, and it's all about the chemistry. The chemistry is the key, right? The basic principles, basic sciences. There's a carbon, phosphate, phosphate, backbone, and then two R groups. A difference in one of these is what makes Boniva, Boniva, and Fosamax, Fosamax, and Zomeda, Zomeda. And so all these companies just came along and cha changed one little side chain and then had a new drug marketed, and, but that little change, and you know, there were lawsuits, no, you just stole our compound and changed it, and sure enough, none of those lawsuits uh, won because they said it's not obvious that changing one thing actually changes lots of things. It's a unique chemistry, it may not work, it takes design, synthesis, you have to test it, and it has different affinity for bone but just by changing one little side chain. So what these drugs do is they have what's called a bone hook, and this is calcium Phosphate. Think of what hydroxyapatite or bone is, right? It's just calcium phosphate, right? Ca10PO46OH2. That's all it is. So the calcium that's exposed gets bound by these oxygen groups and it forms what's called a dentate bond. And it makes bidentate and even tridentate bonds. These are the strongest covalent bonds found in nature. So when th this is why this stuff goes to the skeleton, because there's lots of calcium in the skeleton, and this is why it binds to it with very high affinity, and it binds irreversibly as far as the pharmacokinetics go. It's not reversible. Right? Interestingly, it'll actually go to the skeleton in areas that are more metabolically active or where there's infection, for example, because that's a metabolically active site. So they actually target the most active sites. This is why they do very well for preventing hip fractures and skeletal related events. They go to the sites that need it the most. Right? So we've been exploiting these drugs by creating pharmacologically inert phenyl bisphosphonates like um, these here, and, and I'll show you a little more, and binding them, conjugating them to antibiotics that then release when the bisphosphonate binds to the bone after the patient takes it. Right? And the way that this works, and the way that these cleave, it, you actually have to get the antibiotic to release. Otherwise, it doesn't kill the bacteria. And so this has been one of the challenges over the last decade is the earlier versions of these had very stable conjugation schemes chemically, and the antibiotic wouldn't release, so they didn't work well. They were actually very poor. So this is what we use. This is the, there's the PCP backbone of the um, bisphosphonate with a phenyl. So this is a phenyl um, BP. And then this is ciprofloxacin. And then the linker in the middle is a carbamate uh, compound. So there's three components to this. The bisphosphonate, the antibiotic, and the linker in the middle, right? That linker is very important. It's the key to making all of this happen chem chemically, right? So this is called BCC, bisphosphonate carbamate ciprofloxacin. This is BCX, bisphosphonate carbamate moxifloxacin. Moxifloxacin is a newer generation of fluoroquinolone, which is a lot more potent than the earlier generation ciprofloxacin. And we want to test, does it matter which antibiotic you have? If you have the same class of antibiotic, but one is more potent than the other, will it be more efficacious? So then we should use that one clinically. Um, and then here we have a BCT, which is bisphosphonate carbamate tadizolid. Tadizolid is a relatively recently approved, FDA approved, drug for Staph aureus and MRSA. And it was approved by the GAIN Act, generating antibiotic incentives now. This was one of the laws in 2012 that Obama passed to help save lives of people that get these MRSA infections because we don't have good drugs for MRSA. And so this was very quickly approved uh, by the FDA without having to go through all the normal um, kind of due diligence and routes. Um, that would normally be required. So this is a carbamate linked to to bisphosphonate, and this is a bisphosphonate 
ester to disulid. And the ester linkage is different than the carbamate linkage. The ester linkage is a more labile or faster kinetic releasing. So here we're playing with different combinations of more potent linkages and also faster releasing linkages to see if these have an impact on antimicrobial efficacy. And so when we do standard antimicrobial susceptibility testing studies, here we have minocycline, ciprofloxacin, moxifloxacin, tadizolid, vancomycin, bisphosphonate, carbamate, cipro, bisphosphonate, carbamate, carbamate, moxifloxacin, and then the bisphosphonate, carbamate, tadizolid, bisphosphonate, ester, tadizolid. Don't get confused. I'll summarize this all at the end. But when we do MIC, minimum inhibitory concentration, and minimum back biofilm eradication concentration, because you have to study biofilms differently, um, and they're harder to kill, we see that the individual antibiotics, kind of the parent antibiotics, if you will, like Cipro and Moxie, are much better than these conjugates. The conjugates actually suck. They have very poor MIC in standard assays. And these assays are on polystyrene, which is a plastic, 96 well, typical MIC studies. So on plastic, in your typical kind of planktonic wells, these these don't do very well against S. aureus, and then this is AA uh, for jawbone cases. And you can see that the MICs, again, are a lot better, and these are just, we don't use these clinically, so we don't test them. Um, and, and then we actually look at the affinity of these drugs to hydroxyapatite. And by far, the conjugates have much greater percentage of affinity versus the individual antibiotics. Minocycline is one of the best of the individual antibiotics that's not conjugated for binding to bone or having high bone affinity, which actually makes sense because we use it in dentistry for periodontal disease in things like Arrestin. We put it in the pocket and, and hope that it works. And that's, there's probably, this kind of <laughs> validates why we use minocycline. The tetracycline class in general is pretty decent compared to other antibiotics at getting to heart tissues and mineralized uh, structures. Now we do an assay. This is called a biofilm prevention on hydroxyapatite. It's an in vitro assay where we take hydroxyapatite and then we put these compounds, control nothing, and then min the individual antibiotics and then these conjugates on the hydroxyapatite and then we try to grow bacteria on it. And in the control you get 100% growth, nothing dies, right? And then compared to the control, really only the conjugates have any efficacy in reducing the bacterial load or killing the bacteria. And that's for Staph aureus, and then over here for AA, only the moxifloxacin conjugate really had any statistical efficacy. So when you go from a well or, or, or a plastic to bone or hydroxyapatite, now you're exploiting the bisphosphonate binding. And that's when it works. Otherwise, it sucks. Right. So these are really, this, this class of therapeutics would be useless for anything except bone therapeutics because of the bisphosphonate. Then this is a biofilm eradication assay. Again, we have hydroxyapatite, but now we grow biofilms and then treat them with the antibiotics. And a lot, almost everything works pretty well um, for, against Staph aureus, except the best efficacy is still seen with the conjugates on hydroxyapatite. And against AA, only the moxifloxacin conjugate had any statistical efficacy. So, and this is an ex vivo animal study. So we take bone from rats, these are femurs, and jaws, and we sterilize them, UV irradiate them, and then again we do these prevention and eradication assays. So we'll, and so just to show you an example, this, this bone here is the negative control. No antibiotics, no microbes. Then on this one, no antibiotics, but we grow staph. And this is a TTT assay where it, it'll turn red because of formazin if it's, you know, there's a lot of staph. And here you can see it's all red. So there's lots of staph growing on that bone. Then we give tadizolid, just a, you know, an antibiotic. And then you can see a lot of it's gone when we grow staph. And then cipro and staph, not so good. Then the conjugate and staph, and then uh, ciprofloxacin conjugate and staph. So really, um, this, this ester tadizolid conjugate has the greatest efficacy, which you can see here, in both prevention and, and eradication experiments. And when we do AA on jawbone, same kind of thing. No antibiotic, no microbes, uh, no antibiotic, but we do AA, and you can see it's nice coated with AA. Then we do the bisphosphonate, carbamate, ciprofloxacin, and that seems to be the best compared to just cipro or minocycline alone. 
And again, that conjugate was the most significant statistically. And then we did an in vivo safety and efficacy study. We had about five to six rats per group, three groups, negative saline control. We had a Cipro positive control and then a conjugate. And in the Cipro, we gave it daily, just like you would give it clinically, a multiple dosing regimen. And for the conjugate, we just gave a single dose at one point. And this was intravenous dosing. So what we do in this model, this is a Dr. Zade created this model. It's, it's a, we've used this a lot and published with this a lot. It's a, it's a brilliant model. Um, we take little mini implants. And this is me here. <laughs> and you can barely see. I can't even. It's like a tiny little implant. And we screw two implants into the maxilla or palate there in these animals. But these implants have been pre-coated with biofilms on the undersurface, so with AA biofilms. So it's a, we, and we know the exact CFU of biofilms. So it's a very controlled type of in vivo study where we know exactly how much bacteria we're delivering, and then we're gonna give a therapeutic, and then we're gonna resect that tissue and see how much the bacteria was reduced or not. So it's a very, very nice model to use. And what we found is that compared to the control, the multiple low dose of the parent antibiotic, just ciprofloxacin alone, not the conjugated version of it, um, reduced the bacterial load. But the single high dose of the conjugate was statistically significant um, for reducing uh, the, the infection. And, and there was no adverse effects. So this was a safety efficacy study, uh, kind of before large animal and pre-human testing for our FDA data that we need. Uh, for these uh, drugs, and this made the cover of the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, so I'm really excited about that because, you know, I've never made a cover of anything. <laughs> uh, um, so, and then I do want to say that this kind of shows you, like for the students out there, that when you do research like this, a lot of times you start with a clinical problem, right? You're, you're hopefully you're doing something that has some impact or translation and, and will affect human or veterinary medicine, for example, right? So you start with that, in the beginning, you don't know anything about it, right? You know, kind of when I started this research, we knew very little about bone infections. We were still, it was still being defined, what, what's causing it. Then once you kind of figure out what it is, then you figure out the mechanisms. How does it work, right? How is it happening? Then once you get the mechanisms figured out, then you can start to think about therapeutics and intervention. It's a very, it's a maturity process in the line of an investigator's kind of career. And it took me a decade to get to this point where I could even think about collaborating with chemists and, and saying, hey, why don't we do this? Could we do this? And the chemists would say, why do I need to, why, can you conjugate an antibiotic to a bisphosphonate? Well, I work with chemists like Professor McKenna, who's developed a lot of these for clinical use and things like that. And he looked at me the first time I asked him about this. He said, why would we want to do that? And I said, well, because then we could treat bone infections. There's no treatment right now. He doesn't know anything about clinical bone infectious disease. I don't know anything about chemistry. So he becomes a clinician, I become a chemist, right? So it takes this kind of transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, um, translational approach, and it takes time to get to that as, as a, a researcher. So just be patient if you're doing research. And, and the start is those first projects and posters and, and just having the passion for it. Um, so in conclusion, a target and release chemical strategy with bisphosphonate-linked antibiotic conjugates was used to achieve greater therapeutic efficacy in bone, in vitro and in vivo, and we demonstrated safety and efficacy in an animal model. We found that in standard microbiologic antimicrobial susceptibility testing using polystyrene wells, uh, non-conjugated antibiotics were actually much better than against Staph aureus and AA, but when we used bone as a substrate, um, or bone clinically, conjugates demonstrated the greatest efficacy. And so we show that bone affinity, antibiotic potency, and conjugation schemes are important. So for example, the ester linkage was the most efficacious antimicrobially because it's more releasable, and you have to get that antibiotic released. You can't have it bound. Um, versus the carbamate linkage, for example. And also, the affinity of the bisphosphonate. If you use higher affinity of bisphosphonates, you're gonna get more of the drug there. Not 100% of it is gonna to get to the bone in vivo. Um, so results show that this class of, of conjugates in incorporating osteoabsorptive bisphosphonates and fluoroquinolone or oxazolidinone antibiotics um, are a very effective and promising approach and minimizing systemic exposure. So the good thing is when you dose these clinically, you don't have to worry about adverse effects. These aren't gonna go anywhere except to the skeleton. So it's not gonna cause, Cipro causes Achilles tendon rupture and you know, you're not gonna see things like that potentially clinically. So we've patented a lot other classes of antibiotics but I, uh, because, um, 
but we're, that we're still in the patent process for that, so uh, I've only presented the ones that we've actually gotten patents uh, filed on. Um, and so with that, thank you very much, and I do have to acknowledge the NIH, uh, NIDCR, and NIAID. We, we have grants for this. Um, and of all my collaborators, it does take a village to make this happen. And I have to especially thank Dr. Summerman because I have a great story. I had a $1.5 million grant recently. The program officer says, we're just, we're gonna get you the notice of award, but it's on my director's desk. She has to sign it and then you'll be good. And I said, oh, and I knew it was Dr. Summerman. I had met her before. And I, so he said, he sent me an email basically saying, she has a couple of concerns <laughs> before she signs off on this. And I know she's a savvy scientist and investigator and researcher. So I said, great, give it to me. I'll do my best. And, and I, I, we did get the award. So I, I think, you know, it seems like we appropriately satisfied your concerns and you signed off on that, that grant. So thank you very much. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for highlighting that it's all about research. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my, my um, question was, uh, it just came up to me at the end of your slide when you talked about adversity. Uh -huh. So I was just concerned about all that this talk shows that adversity is in bisphosphonate. Okay, so the, the question is, are you concerned about uh, adverse effects to bisphosphonate that you're feeding to the bone? Um, we've intentionally used concentrations of bisphosphonates that are equivalent or less than what's used clinically already with bisphosphonates. So we have medical and prospective um, uh, rationale and, and basis for doing that. Um, but so both yes and no. No, because we are controlling for that. Um, and uh, two, we're, the, we're really less worried even if we go above that for any toxic effects because uh, we're using high affinity but pharmacologically inner, so there's no cellular effects. So you don't get inhi inhibition of osteoclasts or cells. So um, more of that on the skeleton is just kind of a very small compound that's, you know, r relatively harm harmless. And, and, yeah, and, and so Dr. Summerman said that was my concern also. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a great question. And so we've, uh, this has been, so um, McKenna and Ebatino and Graham Russell, for example, he's the first one to use these um, in pet. These, uh, these are scientists that worked for Procter & Gamble when these drugs were very first developed. They have data that's not even published or released on safety and, and what you can get away with and toxic doses. But as part of this large grant that we have that was uh, approved recently, which we've completed AIM-1, now we're on AIM-2, which is a large animal canine model. AIM-3 is a purely toxicology study. So what we're gonna be doing is actually doing lethal doses and figuring out, uh, because it is a unique conjugate, and the FDA has already told us, because we're at that level, that there's no precedent for this. They don't, there is, it's, it's a combination product. Right, it's three things. It's an antibiotic, it's a drug, and it's a linker. The linker gets released as CO2, so you breathe it out. But we have to demonstrate all this to the FDA, and they're gonna want toxicology and PK studies. So we are planning in two separate animal models to do comprehensive, and that's part of the grant funding is going to doing comprehensive PK. So we can see what level we can get away with. Great questions. All right, I'm, I'm around all day, so if you have more questions, come and talk. <laughs>